thank you to uh, those people uh, who have uh, come along this evening and uh, in particular to uh, Daniel uh, uh, for joining us and Rowan for uh, organizing uh, another uh, of the research seminar series. Um, uh, I'd just like to say a few words on behalf of the Disabled Staff Network. Um, as a, I'm a member of the Disabled Staff Network, uh, someone with epilepsy. Um, the uh, Disabled Staff Network uh, co-chairs, unfortunately, aren't able to be here uh, uh, due to unforeseen circumstances this evening, but they've asked me to uh, uh, pass on some information about the Disabled Staff Network at the University of Edinburgh. Um, it's for uh, disabled staff, chronically Ill, Ill staff, and those with caring responsibilities, uh, and open to PhD students who work for the university, uh, run and led by its disabled members since 2012. It has 100 members, uh, around about 100 members at the moment, um, continually growing, uh, meets every other month. Uh, they, uh, if you'd like to join, uh, go along to the events, uh, find out more. Uh, Robbie has put up their uh, ways to connect in the chat, uh, as well as um, University SharePoint, there's the Twitter and uh, LinkedIn um, that people can join externally. Uh, and uh, recent achievements, uh, introduction of sunflower lanyards for non-visible disabilities. Uh, those can be ordered via the uh, DSN uh, email address. Uh, and the, uh, let's see, they also sit on the University Equality, Diversity, Inclusion Committee and the Disability and Inclusivity Subcommittee. And they uh, will be a leading voice in the development of uh, Disability Equality Action Plan and Disability Policy for the University of Edinburgh. Uh, so that's uh, really great to see that the disabled the staff network uh, are really making an impact uh, and uh, getting lots of disabled staff members and PhD, uh, PhDs uh, involved. Um, as uh, for me, as the, one of the co-chairs of the Staff Pride Network for LGBT plus colleagues and allies, I, uh, I'm really excited uh, that uh, we've got another event in our research seminar series. Uh, they, if you haven't seen uh, all of them yet, uh, they're all available on our YouTube uh, channel. And um, I think the only other thing uh, I'll say just now uh, is that um, we'd love to find out uh, from our feedback form uh, what you thought about the event, or if you don't feel like you've got time to do that, uh, you can uh, just pop in the couple of the questions there, uh, where you're from, uh, how you identify, uh, and uh, it really uh, it really adds some interest for the organisers of the events to see uh, how well we're reaching. Uh, so thank you very much, and I'll pass you over to uh, our research officer, Ron. Jonathan. Yeah, I'm the research officer for the Staff Brain Network, so it's my role to promote um, the research of LGBT individuals, whether their research is about LGBT topics or not. Um, and I organize research seminars. So if you are a researcher of any, any form, you are very welcome to present at one of these events. Um, and so this event today was going to be a neurodiversity celebration week, but UCU um, strike action kind of pushed it a bit further back. So we're really glad that we've got Daniel um, along to talk about his research. Um, and I know Dan through, he co-organizes the Queer Geographies reading group with me. Um, and his research is, I'm going to find the title, um, titled Geographies of Impulse, Threat Syndrome, the Embodied Experience of Public Spaces. Um, there'll be some time for some questions at the end, um, so you can put those in the Q&A as we go or leave it to later. Um, and that's all for me, so I'll hand over to Dan. Um, was said, I'm Daniel and I'm going to be sharing some, um, yeah, early, admittedly quite messy initial kind of findings from 
um, from my PhD research, um, which, yeah, as Rowan said, is titled Geographies of Impulse Tourette Syndrome in the Embodied Experience of Public Spaces. Um, so, yeah, a bit about me. I'm, uh, I'm Daniel and uh, my pronouns are he, him. And I'm yeah doing my PhD at the moment in human geography and I'm based at Newcastle University. Um, and I'm an artist and a creative and I work across, like aside from academic work, I work across fine art, theater and creative writing. Um, and then I'm neurodiverse and queer, which is how I suppose I, I guess fit into these this week's um, events, I suppose. So um, yeah, so I guess to begin, I thought it would be, useful to really quickly just contextualize Tourette syndrome for anyone who you know might not be familiar. Um, so basically it's a neurological condition that is characterized by tics. Um, and these can be uncontrollable vocalizations, sounds, intrusive thoughts, and so on and so forth. Um, you can have a, an onset or diagnosis of Tourette syndrome at any age, but for a diagnosis, generally you need to have had a combination of what are called motor, and vocal tics for over one year. Um, and it's generally quite hard to get a diagnosis if you experience onset in adulthood. Um, I personally have a diagnosis and I have done uh, for quite a while now. Um, and currently I'm quite involved in online community and safe space facilitation within the Tourettic community. And um, just, you know, as some context uh, regarding my positionality, um, I suppose. Um, so yeah, regarding my research, my background, um, I generally I'm really interested in affect and space and place and, and disabled bodies. And then for the specific research, um, I decided yeah to look into the the embodied experiences for of public spaces for Tourette adults uh, like myself. So just I guess a quick rundown of methods related stuff. Um, I use kind of a mixture of traditional and more kind of creative methods. So it includes focus groups, a whole bunch of in-depth, uh, semi-structured interviews, and then a lot of kind of creative, collaborative art and collaborative zine making. Um, and yeah, on the note of collaboration, actually, the project was designed um, in collaboration with both the, a charity called Tick Hull, which is based in Hull, um, and is kind of like an education and Tourette syndrome awareness based charity. And also it was designed um, in collaboration with like a, a core pool of participants for the project who are all service users at Tick Hull. Um, it does involve people from outside of that group as well, but those are kind of the people who, yeah, assisted in its design and, and things. Um, so regarding this presentation, I guess, just a quick rundown of like structure, I suppose. Um, I'm going, yeah, to just really quickly chat about um, the kind of data I've collected so far. Um, maybe a little bit about the demographics of the participants that are involved, just for some context. And then what I'll do is to try and keep anchored and not go off on a tangent like I, I love to do. Um, I'm going to try and split it up by chatting about each of my four kind of key research questions separately to try and give it some kind of structure. Um, and yeah, and then I guess I'll kind of summarize with some early initial kind of pending conclusions, I suppose. Um, so yeah, regarding the data, um, I've currently conducted 19 interviews um, with the vast majority lasting over one hour. And I've done two focus groups um, and then I've also collected a bunch of creative work from five kind of core participants um, who are members of the charity I'm working with. Um, and this includes a series of kind of prompted creative writing, what are called mini zines. Um, and then we're also currently in the process of creating a, like a collaborative zine with um, everyone's work and we're all designing that. Um, as a collective. And uh, on the slide on the right there is a printed first draft just from the other day. Got that back just the other day. So very excited about that. Um, but yes, so without further ado, the first research question, uh, and obviously these can kind of change, you know, as you go through a PhD, but the first question that I'm going to focus on today at least is how is the theoretic experience of public spaces unique? And to what extent is Tourette syndrome a barrier to using them? 
So one thing that really has interested me in relation to this first research question um, was that basically my initial findings are kind of suggesting a sort of hypersensitivity or almost hyper affective nature of Tourette syndrome. So part of this is due to kind of highly context dependent nature of tics. And this can include like the type of tics and the severity or intensity. Um, so just as some real brief examples, all every single one of the participants that have been involved so far um, have individually of their own accord, not even prompted, have all brought up that um, kind of bright flickering strip lighting that is often found in supermarkets and offices is something that could for them increase um, or kind of yeah trigger a period of increased ticking. And this along with certain other kinds of si social situations such as um, spaces where it's kind of expected that you're quiet or silent or equally on the flip side of things, um, spaces that are full of sudden loud noises. Um, and those are just kind of a couple of examples of what seems to be like the endless context that like external context that can influence theoretic experience. Um, and that's very brief and broad. I'm very aware of that. But if you kind of keep those ideas in your mind as we go over the next few slides, hopefully that will I don't know, help contextualize some bit. Um, but yeah, so within the pool of participants for this project, the vast majority experience what are known as premonitory urges prior to ticks. So these can be described as, yeah, perhaps like elastic points whereby an individual can feel where, and in some cases, what a tick might be prior to it happening. Um, and for me, I'd argue that this significantly changes, you know, the individual's relationship to their own body and, and this increased, you know, hypersensitivity, not only to these aforementioned kind of external factors, but also the internal urges that precede impulsive ticks are also what I'm kind of going to try and conceptualize as part of the contextual nature of, you know, theoretic experience and of ticks. So, for example, one participant in an interview um, stated that, quote, the moment before I tick feels like when the drop is about to happen on a roller coaster and you're just waiting for your stomach to drop, end quote. Um, so then in the zine making workshop a few months later, um, she created this mini zine, which I've tried to like lay out here on the slide so you can kind of see um, easier. But it's basically she's titled it The Roller Coaster of Tourette's Syndrome. Um, and I feel like this illustrates this quite well, what she was talking about. So, yeah, now with premonitory urges, you know, being felt at kind of varying intensities, depending on the context, whether that is part of what one participant described as the calming twinkly lights found in UK high streets around Christmas that lessen the severity of ticks or um, another participant who chatted about loud school bells in his workplace is he's a teacher um, and also even in my own kind of experience of motor tics being directed towards people who come into my range or reach I think it's really important to acknowledge that you know this is all relational and contextual and so perhaps I don't know I'm feeling like my kind of initial findings are suggesting that there's some kind of hyper affectiveness that is maybe inherent to the theoretic experience and maybe that is part of what's unique about it. Um, and I guess this all kind of leads me back to the consideration of um, philosopher Erin Manning's ideas uh, surrounding the elasticity of almost movement. And I've tried to make a brief diagram on here to explain it because I, I find it quite confusing. I don't know about any of you, but I'm quite a visual person. Um, but basically the way that Manning discusses this idea is through the metaphor of dance. So she describes that, yeah, in a couple's dance, notably the tango movement occurs in relation to the partner. So the leader doesn't control, but rather guides the other, uh, the other person. Um, and that same leader, you know, provides the kind of pre-acceleration of almost movement that um, is sensed almost by that other, other dancing body, um, kind of based on this assumption in geography that the human body is an affective body, which means it can both affect things and be affected by things, um, if that makes sense. Um, so as a result, these two bodies are moving somewhat grace gracefully and with relative ease. Um, and each movement is prefaced with this pre-accelerative, like almost movement that propels it forward across the dance floor. 
Um, and at the peak of each almost movement is where this elasticity of almost movement comes into play. So these points of maximum elasticity are the peaks of almost movement. So if you look at the diagram, um, this is supposed to kind of represent a ball being tied to a piece of a piece of elastic, which is bouncing back and forth as the point that it's fixed to is moving along this curved line. Um, and you know when you kind of map the trajectory of of that um, ball that's attached to the elastic, um, you can see some kind of you know obvious pattern or rhythm kind of coming to surface in the diagram. Um, but it's important here to note that the context of each point is changing each time. Hence why there are separate triangles being made in that, um, if that makes sense, which is why it's a rhythm rather than like an isolated event, if that makes any sense. Um, so basically the, the kind of curvature of that line is influenced by affective ev events, basically. So that could be as simple as someone shouting somebody's name. That could be someone opening a door, kind of, you know, even like turning a light on or off. The kind of possibilities there are endless in, in that sense. Um, now, I'd say this is really useful for us in thinking about how affect works and how it influences generically, you know, just kind of engagement and interaction with spaces across the board, whether that's public, private, online, offline, whatever. Um, however, I'd say if we kind of take a Tourette's approach or kind of look through the lens of Tourette's syndrome and consider ticks as affective events, then, you know, the diagram might kind of, yeah, perhaps be a little bit more confusing in at least seemingly more chaotic at first glance, as, as you can see here, I've tried to kind of represent that here as well and, and map that trajectory. Um, yeah, so in this, each tick could be considered as an individual inflection that's changing that curvature. Um, and, and basically, you know, evidently it's altering the, the trajectory or the course of that ball quite significantly. So then if we put the diagram side by side, one, you know, Obviously, the, the Tourettic one looks a lot more kind of impulsive and chaotic, right? Um, and and maybe a bit harder to follow. Um, however, you'll probably notice that the triangles, albeit less recognizably similar, they're very much still present in that Tourettic version. They're just kind of smaller and with kind of greater variation, if that makes sense. Um, so like... Yeah, and like I mentioned, if you look closer at the non tourettic version, that does also have some variation in the size of the triangles, um, which is also showing this kind of like lack of absolute repetition in its rhythm. So whilst many kind of generally have kind of considered ticks in previous literature, at least, have considered ticks and Tourette syndrome as chaotic and quite frankly making no sense and not being logical and kind of being, you know, abnormal, to me it seems here that this chaos or chaotic rhythm isn't just inherent to the Tourettic experience, but it's like rather an inherent part of the human experience, you know, or the affective experience, simply due to the fact that, like I said, humans are affective beings. Um, the rhythm just feels or kind of like appears perhaps more amorphous would be the right word to use, um, at least at the surface level in the case of Tourette syndrome. And so, Trying to sum up that, I'd say that this kind of teaches us that, you know, context is vital and important to consider when thinking about the Tourettic experience. And, and yeah, like, like I said, perhaps it has a more significant or obvious effect on the Tourettic experience than the non-Tourettic experience when it comes to public spaces. So the participants of this project, um, obviously kind of discussing it in other words, but um, they kind of tended to find this hyper affectivity of sorts quite distressing when when discussing um their experience of and others interaction with um kind of Tourette syndrome and and they kind of viewed this hyper affectivity generally in a more negative um light particularly when it came to discussions about accessing public spaces so frustrations over mobility needs people staring or making comments and so on were were common amongst every participant that, that has been involved in the project so far. Um, and we can see this kind of summarized in the image here of one participant's doodle from the zine making session, which kind of explains that sensory overload for them is a key part of the way that they experience space in relation to Tourette syndrome um, because of that kind of hyper affectivity. Um, we can also see it 
covered elsewhere in uh, the first draft of the collaborative zine, particularly from the quotation here, quote, in public, in public places, it can be stressful with people staring and saying stuff and, make, and it makes me tick worse, end quote. So evidently it's not only kind of like physical or kind of obviously sensory things that can influence the theoretic experience such as sound, lighting, et cetera, et cetera, but it's also these kind of, yeah, assumed non-sensory aspects that influence atmospheres of places such as staring. And staring in particular is something that has been explored quite extensively um, by Garland Thompson in relation to disability more generally speaking. So I suppose some of my findings here do kind of align with some more general or generic kind of previously published literature that is out there already. Um, However, it was interesting because there were a few people who kind of thought of this hyper affectivity in a positive light and not actually in relation to kind of, you know, barriers to accessing public space um, or to using it, whatever that might look like for them. So one story that really stuck out to me, and I will say all names that are used here are pseudonyms just for context, but um, one story that, yeah, stuck out to me was from Ricky, who informed me of a seagull noise tick that they really enjoyed and a direct quote from this interview reads quote when I moved to Brighton I was with my partner and he was like you keep on making this noise and what I was doing was doing a seagull noise over and over again a month or two in we looked outside and saw the sea saw a seagull make the noise and he looked at me and I echoed the seagull and he was like you're fucking making the seagull noise so I had like seagull echolalia for ages and for someone who was involved with queer nature stuff it felt really nice because I liked that I'm able to react to things in my auditory environment and turn them into ways of expressing myself end quote um I don't know about you but yeah, that was a direct quote and it kind of felt like quite a profound, like well thought out statement and if, as if they were writing a thesis themselves. So it baffled me. But um, yeah, that's just, you know, one kind of example of almost like the humorous or almost like wholesome aspect of how Tourette's kind of influences engagement with public spaces. So it's kind of more neutral, you know, it doesn't have to be a barrier. It can just be a thing that is there to be enjoyed, if that makes sense. Um, and so, yeah, whilst the overwhelming majority was framing or were framing Tourette's kind of as a barrier, um, the one thing that did stand true across all the data, so what has done so far, is the importance of public space when we're thinking about community building. So Tabitha was chatting about her experiences of an international Tourette syndrome exchange and how it was nice to build community by failing together in terms of failing to act what is supposedly normal in public, um, as one example. However, yeah, the vast majority of the project's participants kind of encounter and build and, yeah, and encounter and build community in online spaces more than they do in physical spaces. Um, and that was the case even before kind of COVID and, and kind of um, social isolation and things like that. So, yeah, I think, it's interesting when we start to kind of conceptualize public space to be inclusive of these online spaces too. And um, I guess I'll chat about it a bit, but I think it really changes the narratives quite significantly of, of what these participants are trying to put across. So there's this narrative at the moment amongst medical professionals that online spaces and social media sites are objectively negative because of claims that apps such as TikTok are spreading Tourette syndrome-like symptoms. Um, but actually, this all of the participants were really frustrated with, with this kind of narrative going around at the moment. And, and they have unanimously all stated, again, individually, that community is important. And, and, and the vast majority talked about how online spaces in particular were the spaces that were the most vital for them in kind of finding community and, and just kind of coming to, to grips and coming to kind of understand their own bodies and, and experiences and so on. And actually many had never even been able to meet with others um, who have a diagnosis of Tourette syndrome ever before and some still haven't in person. Um, and it's led to them feeling super isolated, hence why kind of these participants in, in particular stated that they were turning to these online kind of forums and, and social media sites in particular. So I'd say, you know, community, it allows for people to not only come to terms with their individual experiences, um, but, you know, also to feel engaged with the elements of kind of 
the collective experience of Tourette's as such. Um, with lots of, again, lots of participants stating that they were seeking kind of reassurance um, by joining online groups and try, hoping to see people post similar experiences that they'd been having of Tourette's online. And, you know, that whether that was generally speaking about ticks or kind of non-tick related aspects of Tourette's or whether that was kind of thinking about specific instances and intersections of the Tourette's experience. So for the data I've collected so far, it includes, but isn't limited to Tourette's and menstruation and gender and employment and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of ways, clearly, you know, it's all intersectional. And I think, you know, it's not such a revolutionary thing to say, but, you know, intersectionality is so key in considering all of this. Um, yeah, and then participants who did mention the importance of these experiences for them, yeah, they also all stated how these conversations, they felt like they were only really safe to have away from non theoretic stakeholders in Tourette syndrome, um, who often kind of populate these online groups. Um, and these kind of non theoretic stakeholders could be, again, they include, but it's not limited to, um, maybe a, an able-bodied parent or family member, or generally just non-disabled allies, um, who, according to my own and sadly other participants' experiences, either oftentimes kind of gaslight elements of people's Tourette's experience, um, particularly when it comes to sharing about adulthood onset of Tourette's, um, or see, or they're just there to kind of seek reassurance that their children who have a diagnosis of Tourette's aren't doomed to the end of the earth, um, as one of my participants quoted. Um, so yeah, whilst these conversations and kind of discussions in this community building in theory could have you know, happened in person and in offline spaces and support groups, one participant summed up the experiences of a lot of people rather well in her discussion of, yeah, her experience of kind of attending what was advertised as an adults with Tourette support group, um, which turned out not to have any Tourette adults. Um, and it was just full of these adult stakeholders who didn't have Tourette's. So whilst in this instance, um, the participant, uh, yeah, so in this instance, the participant attended um, like an in-person support group in an attempt to try and get support for a diagnosis that she'd got within the last couple of weeks. She ended up being the only one um, who is an adult with Tourette's there. Um, and she was the one that these non tourettic parents just came looking to her for support. And actually, sadly, this is the case across a large majority of the participants. And again, it's similar in my own experience as well. Um, and this, you know, it's meant that some of the participants that were involved in the project so far have felt the need to kind of take matters into their own hands and create these online support networks themselves without any kind of financial or logistical kind of aid from charities or healthcare services or anything. People, yeah, had felt that ironically sharing their own authentic experiences of Tourette's syndrome and even just having a diagnosis of Tourette's syndrome was something that was excluding them from these spaces that were, in, in the first instance, were meant to be designed for them. Um, and I just thought that was a really interesting thing to, to note there. Uh, in contrast to all of this, though, again, and this is why it's really interesting to consider on those spaces in such depth, um, some participants were chatting to me about their experiences of, you know, using social media platforms, and, and, and lots of these participants were kind of feeling that these online places, you know, counted as public spaces, um, which is kind of where this conceptualization has come from, because it was collaboratively designed, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so lots of people discussed particularly TikTok, and they kind of discussed how Tourette syndrome could, in their kind of views, potentially be considered as beneficial in what they termed successful engagement with online public spaces. Um, and yeah, it was just, however, it was just interesting to note that these people were either kind of experiencing significant boosts in kind of content engagement if they had stereotypical symptoms such as coprolalia, which is um, kind of like swearing and profanities, but those who didn't have these more stereotypical um, symptoms of Tourette's didn't experience that boost in kind of engagement and, and they didn't kind of experience what they deemed as, a, as an increase in success engagement and success, successful engagement in these public spaces, if, if that makes sense. 
Um, so it was just interesting and I kind of did a bit of digging and more kind of chatting to people and it seemed like people kind of had this idea that the algorithm on social media sites is seeming to kind of boost theoretic content creators who do experience these more, you know, stereotypically kind of media, fo the uh, symptoms that me the media has kind of focused on because of their like entertainment factor, so to speak. Um, and actually, if you look into this, there's a lot of discussion about it. You could even if you do a Google search, Google search and it would be there. But its success has actually been so significant that there's kind of a lot of talk of how people have begun faking Tourette syndrome and even kind of posting non Tourette content, but using a hashtag Tourette's on videos to, to try and boost their own engagement. And, you know, again, what is deemed a success in, in this online public space. Um, and in turn, this has led to lots of my participants who kind of created TikToks in particular to feel that they had been what is called shadow banned, um, where a social media site's algorithm kind of notices almost this kind of false hashtagging and so suppresses the, like the dissemination of that short form content because they think it's kind of like spam hashtagging, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, those are my very messy initial thoughts for that first research question. Um, it's all over the place, and as you can see, I'm kind of drowning in data. But um, in short, yeah, the chaotic nature of Tourette's experience, I'm feeling like it's not unique in terms of Tourette's. I would say rather it's just common across human experience, but you know, the Tourette's body is hyper effective, and so this chaos is more visible. Um, I'd also say, you know, participants of varying experiences of whether they feel that Tourette's is a barrier to using these public spaces. And there's, yeah, interesting contradictions that kind of occur when we expand that definition of public space to include kind of virtual online worlds. Um, and I'd love to explore this in a lot more detail, but, you know, it's early findings that of the time. I, I could talk forever about it. I won't bore you forever. Um, so I'd say that first kind of question is the one that I've done significantly you know, the majority of reflecting on at the moment. So don't worry, these next sections aren't all going to be that long for like four questions. Um, but the second question I was kind of seeking to answer in my research <laughs> reads, to what extent do the materialities of space and social difference in, uh, influence the theoretic experience of public spaces? Um, so one element of social difference that was commonly raised in the data was the use of disability aids. Um, including, but not limited to, walking sticks, wheelchairs, earplugs, lanyards, and um, using carers and kind of caregivers as, for support. So this kind of, you know, it's a rather visual, it's this rather visual signifier of social difference in public spaces has resulted in, in lots of the participants kind of experiencing staring or kind of glares, questioning about why they need to use aids, particularly when it came to kind of mobility related aids or even comments such as you're too young to be using a wheelchair or on the flip side of things you're too old to be playing with that fidget spinner. As I carried out interviews and focus groups it became really quite obviously apparent to me that the kinds of aids that were being used in public spaces were key in influencing the experience of public space that Tourette's have because lots of the participants um, and myself included kind of you know, mobility, for example, fluctuates quite significantly. So someone might use a wheelchair, then the next day they won't need to use any mobility aids and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, change even happens on that or on that like individual level. So in an interview with Yebi, she stated that when she used a wheelchair, quote, people are so positive and understanding and so quick to move out the way and everyone's quick to say good morning. Whereas if I'm walking down the street ticking, even with a walking stick, it's the polar opposite. And there's people that cross the roads with their kids just to avoid me. Um, yeah. So I'd say, you know, it's always kind of like evidencing the conceptualization of disability aids as, as what are kind of known as cultural artifacts that, that have significant influence over people's experiences of these public spaces. So thinking about Yebi's experience in particular, I started thinking about the International Symbol of Access or the ISA and how you know, it's a wheelchair. Every, most people will be familiar with, with, this, with this kind of symbol. You know, it's clearly a signifier of disability that is relevant in considering the experiences of the project's participants and, and, and 
you know, it leads us to think about ideas of performing disability or kind of performing ability, neurodiversity, and so on and so forth. Um, and I think that was also evident in an extract from Stacy as a part of um, one of the focus groups that I conducted, where she said, quote, I feel like a fraud going into the shop with crutches one day, and then the next I'll go in my wheelchair. A lot of people who know me like the regular staff will look at me as if to say, well, she was walking yesterday, she's not walking today, end quote. However, it's not only impactful on like the performance of disability in, in, in thinking about how others view these theoretic individuals, um, but also on the relationship with the self as disabled or neurodiverse or able-bodied and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, the symbolic significance of a wheelchair as an indicator of disability came across in Bella's interview, where she said, quote, I'm struggling to come to terms that it, um, with the fact that in two more sleeps, I'm going to have a wheelchair at home. That's really difficult to get my head around because I'm able-bodied. Without it, I'm not safe, but I can't see myself in one, end quote. However, Bella then made conscious decisions um, following kind of interviews that, and, and discussions with her um, in the zine workshop to visualize her experience of public spaces by drawing herself in a wheelchair um, in multiple instances. And this is just two examples of, of, of her work. Um, evidently, despite previously not even being able to imagine herself using it because she didn't identify as disabled, it became really significant in the role of kind of determining her theoretic embodied experience of public spaces. And again, this is something that I really want to look into um, in a lot more detail at a later date, but those are kind of like this, I don't want to say surface level kind of findings, but yeah. And yeah, there's a bunch of other information within this research question, kind of thinking about ideas of the verbal disclosure of Tourette syndrome. But again, sadly, I, I, I won't have time to chat about it here, um, but happy to answer questions about it at the end if you want. Um, and yeah, I guess lastly for this question, for the second research question, um, I think it's really interesting to consider, again, what, you know, what is the equivalent of this in online spaces? You know, how does symbolic disclosure occur online? Um, and I think it's something I really want to think about a little more as I move forward, but um, and I'm starting to think about things such as social media bios, the use of emojis in certain kind of posts and things like that, um, very up in the air at the moment. But yeah, I, I want to think about that more as I move forward. Um, but generally, kind of these initial, conclu in initial conclusion, it seems like the material aspect of interaction with public space and ideas of social difference are, you know, to put it really quite simply, um, extremely significant when it comes to the theoretic experience of public spaces. And I think every single person in who was involved in the project, um, you know, shared stories that that, shared, that demonstrated that, not necessarily in terms of, you know, how Bella used um, a wheelchair, but yeah, it, it was different examples per, depending on the person. And then, so perhaps this is my shortest section so far, but the third question is, how can creative and collaborative methods be used to capture the theoretic experience of public spaces? So for this, I have a series of interviews and focus groups lined up with those who were involved in the zine making process to chat about all things relating to this research question. So I don't have an awful lot to say here, but at first glance, I do imagine that some people will feel a little conflicted about, you know, how represented they do feel um, purely due to the fact that all participants have been, you know, have, have very individual and, and, you know, personal, unique experiences. Um, so, yeah, I think it'll be really interesting to see if the zine, they feel like the zine is representative of their experience. Um, but, yeah, just so you kind of get a chance to have a quick glance at some of the um, 38 pages we have so far for the zine. I won't show you 38 pages, but just so you've got a couple of examples. Um, so here we've got the front and the back cover on the left and the front cover on the right. The way that zines are printed is weird. So this is, yeah, how it is, first and last page. Um, so for example, we decided to name the zine Tick Tick Boom based on a musical as one of the participants was ticking lyrics from it because she just kind of watched the, the new film of it. And as a group, um, we kind of discussed what we would want to call the zine and generally there were kind of discussions about how they felt like Tick Tick Boom was kind of a funny memory and it represented like the playful nature of Tourette syndrome and of the workshop. Um, you know, not everyone unanimously agreed, but, you know, that was the one that kind of 
people settled on in the end. Um, here we've got a page on the left titled My Safe Space, um, which was kind of one of the creative prompts that we gave people in the workshop. So it features phrases such as soft, 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 and quote, a support system. Um, and then on the right, there's some text here responding to a question in an interview um, where the participant wanted to share about their other diagnoses and how, you know, that impacts their experiences of public space too, and, and thinking about the importance of considering intersectional approaches when we're talking about Tourette syndrome. So she was talking about diagnoses of epilepsy and autism, and there are other pages that go into more depth about that experience, but um, yeah. And then the last example I'll show you is that this one, so it's a double page spread titled T-Rex syndrome, as in Tyrannosaurus Rex, um, which was based on an experience this participant had where a, a child she taught swimming asked another child, oh, why is this person, why is the coach making strange noises? And the other child said, she has T-Rex syndrome, um, which I think was really cute. Um, but yeah, it basically talks, this like little mini zine, I guess, talks about a variety of topics, such as, like I said, how children react to ticks, and it kind of debunks some other kind of misconceptions about Tourette's. Um, so yeah, very vague, very rushed through that, but hopefully that highlights some of the sorts of content that yeah, the kind of content that this zine is featuring so far. And like I said, I'm really looking forward to in, you know, exploring that research question in a, in a lot more depth. Um, you know, I'm just very aware of the importance of trying to kind of consider both individual and collective experiences. So, you know, it'll be interesting to reflect and think about how um, this project has done in terms of navigating and representing that in, in a collaborative piece of work. Um, and then last but not least, the kind of final question that I have for my research is asking what can geographical considerations of a theoretic point of view contribute um, in regards to A, charitable organizations and their practices and B, healthcare professionals and their practices. So yeah, I feel inclined to mention firstly that there's overwhelming evidence already that there's a lack of services, both in quantity and quality for adult theoretics. Um, and that's in the UK and further afield. And, and we can see that when we think back to that example of the participant, you know, who went to that support group for looking for support and ended up being the support giver. Um, Tabitha also mentioned that she was the co-founder of a support group for adults because she had, quote, no other choice but to seek and facilitate her own support system, end quote. Um, so, I mean, even from doing, like I said before, like a quick Google search online, what participants kind of raise in this data is going to be backed up by pages and pages and pages of your results. Like there's no shortage of kind of accounts of this, um, what is kind of deemed a failure of the services for theoretic adults. And so regarding implications for charitable organizations, I would simply argue that it highlights the need for a shifting focus on service provision away from non theoretic stakeholders, such as siblings or people with Tourette's or parents, um, on and moving it like onto the theoretic individuals themselves. So, you know, and with it, with that as well, I'll also say that the implications of that specific example on healthcare professionals and practices is just to be aware of the limitation of the current services that are advertised as being for adults with Tourette's. Um, lots of people will kind of point people in the direction of the leading charity that doesn't really do anything for adults with Tourette's just because it's the leading most well-known charity. Um, and then referring back again to Tabitha's interview, she kind of write, she wrote that or stated that, quote, having an online space where it's really protected is so important. It's funny how many people don't have Tourette's um, try and join these spaces and come into them. I don't know the motivation for that. Some people are trying to sell you a cure. Some are trying to sell you a T-shirt. No, respect this boundary. And I think that is a quote that kind of illustrates these examples real concisely and simply. Um, and then further to this, there are considerations of the importance of online spaces through the aforementioned examples, particularly, like I said before, regarding, you know, social media sites. So the data that I've collected so far suggests that support for theoretic adults has largely been found online um, or by people facilitating their own spaces, which um, incidentally are also hosted online. There's been discussion of supposed links between um, these sorts of sites, such as TikTok, um, and Tourette syndrome, with some medical journal articles suggesting that there's a mass increase of Tourette-like symptoms, is 
due to people using TikTok, basically. And, and therefore, there's like even guidance on the MHS website that is urging parents to, if they don't want people to get Tourette's, then they should stop their children from using the internet and things. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned before, all of these adults um, in my project, you know, some of them had childhood onset and they used these online spaces as children as well to kind of develop community. And I'd argue that, you know, these online spaces are so vital and that some people in, in the project have kind of described them as life saving for them. Um, and I guess, yeah, finally, in terms of speaking to medical professionals, every single participant at the end of every interview I've done, um, I've asked kind of, you know, what is one thing that you want to tell people about Tourette's? And everyone's come up with more than one thing, but there's not a single person that hasn't said or like spoken against this narrative that everyone with Tourette's wants rid of Tourette's syndrome and its symptoms. Um, and I think participants are really keen that it's um, something that is shared within this project, um, particularly, you know, in, in, in the kind of hope to encourage medical professionals to think about that before seeking to prescribe specific medications for specific purposes. Long story short, it's all like community and support over treatment and cure. Um, and so with all of that, I know I've kind of rambled on a lot and I've tried to cover a lot of ground, but um, we come to like the following initial conclusion. So I guess I'll just read this off the slide for, for the ease, but Tourette, you know, the Tourette experience is unique in its hyper affectivity but not in its rhythms of chaos. That's just a human experience. Um, the second main thing at the moment is that online space, online public space engagement can benefit perhaps from Tourette syndrome and its symptoms rather than it being a barrier for based on participant experiences and kind of narrate narrations of their own experience. Thirdly, the physical symbolizers of social difference are significant in influencing the Tourette experience of public space, both in how others react to and relate to Tourette's and how these Tourette's, you know, relate to and understand their own bodies. And then finally, like I said, we need to acknowledge the limitations of existing services and kind of shift our focus significantly if we want to, you know, safeguard and, and look after this community. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for listening to my rambled kind of unfinished you know, kind of appropriately chaotic thoughts um, about all of this. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm wanting to research uh, and do more kind of reflecting and, and data collection based on these research questions um, moving forward. But hopefully this kind of like illustrates roughly where I'm at with the project and kind of gives, I don't know, maybe inspires some interesting questions or conversations afterwards. But um, yeah, thanks for listening. And I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Yeah, a um, so I was interested in the kind of effect theory overall and how much, if anything, is written from that perspective on, on Tourette's. Um, I know, are there any like bodies of literature that you've drawn from? Uh, so was that in terms of like kind of putting that Tourette diagram kind of thing together or? Yeah. Um, so that was kind of based on some very rough notes I actually found when I was doing my from when I was doing a master's because um, I was like trying to understand what the hell this Erin Manning was talking about back in my master's and I didn't understand what it was and I was trying to sketch it out and I was just kind of yes yeah, so there wasn't like specific literature that I was drawing on other than kind of Erin Manning's book Relationscapes um, but yeah, it's very much based kind of on my own frustration of not relating to anything that was being taught to me at Masters. And I kind of was reflecting back on that and seeing how that kind of lined up with some of my participants' experiences. I don't know if that really answers the question, but yeah. It does. <laughs> I was also thinking about um, whether your participants talked about the impact of COVID and lockdown, because obviously, space really changed everything was a lot quieter was was that talked about much um in terms of like hmm i think yeah so in terms of things like the sound and kind of like how busy places were and things it, that wasn't really discussed at all it was very much the topic of conversation was very much kind of when we talked about covid shifted to these online spaces um so it was kind of almost like there was no specific consideration generally um, 
of these things. I think from memory, one or two participants kind of chatted about how, uh, well, there's contrasting experiences. So I remember one was chatting about how they felt weird because they tick when they were walking through an empty high street and it would echo and it would make them feel uncomfortable. But then another person was saying they felt free to tick because there was no one there. So it made them feel free. So yeah, that was something that was discussed very briefly, but um, yeah, the focus was definitely in, in terms of like online spaces and in, 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 in kind of private I, like spaces of isolation, I suppose, yeah. when it came to COVID. There's a question that relates to that. It says, is there any actual evidence of a causal link between TikTok and Tourette's rather than just a correlation? I'm glad you've asked that because I've done a lot of searching and I don't think there is because I can't find anything that isn't just, so lots of these are medical journals. And if you're not familiar with medical journals, a lot of the way that lots of medical journals work is that, you know, they, they publish an awful lot of, of kind of articles and it's more kind of, here's a paragraph of things that I've noticed from some of my participants, um, from, a, from, a, some, from some of my patients. So one example, I can't remember specific names because there's lots of people who've done it, but generally people will say like, <clears throat> they'll write an article that says, <laughs> I've had six participants, um, I keep saying participants, six patients in the last two or three months who are teenage girls who have come with sudden onset of Tourette-like symptoms. And the only thing that I can see that links them is that they all use TikTok. And people jump onto this these things because they don't kind of look at them critically. This is my opinion. Um, you know, I've done a lot of reading around and trying to find if there is any data about it and there really isn't. Um, like, and all that, this is very new stuff, like stuff that's being written, like lots of this has been published in the last couple of months even. Um, but you know, like the media gets a hold of it because there's lots, lots of funding in medical sciences and they go open access and then, media jumps onto it and then that you know then it kind of like snowballs into something that's a bit out of control and then the NHS jump on it and then charities jump on it and you know so I think there's some kind of wedge that needs to be driven that's a bit more critical there but long story short I'm not aware of any actual evidence that shows a link I think it's just a correlation I think that's <laughs> similar with lots of neurodiversity in that TikTok has provided a platform in which um, it's visible to lots of people and people are suddenly noticing things about themselves that they maybe didn't know before. Yeah, and there's like kind of links with that to, I've not seen anyone write about it, but I've been thinking about, I, think, I can't even remember what it was called, it was like, dan like the dancing mania or something, um, and how there's this kind of thing where how people were like, it was like a confusing psychosocial thing where people were I mean, I'm not familiar with it, but people were apparently a long time ago, you know, dancing until they passed out and they couldn't stop. And people kind of like have, write, have been writing about that and said, oh, yeah, that was all like it was wrong. It was all like other stuff. It wasn't, you know, related to any specific food or something. I can't remember the exact example, so perhaps not a great one to use. But there, there are links there in terms of like claiming jumping to conclusions, basically. Um, but it seems that no one has really learned from that or other kinds of examples and um, like conclusions about you know people who are autistic being specifically geeky boys who are skinny and are socially awkward you know like that's another thing that people just noticed because it was a correlation because someone was treating similar patients basically and people jumped to that conclusion and those stereotypes and it causes stigma and so on um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of depth to that. I could rant on about that forever, but I'll stop. <laughs> there's a bit of time for some final questions if anyone does have any. Since this is um, a Staff Pride Network event alongside the Disabled Staff Network, I, I did want to ask, um, has your identity shaped your research in any way? Um, Definitely. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I often tell people I kind of fell into this research. Um, you know, I, I kind of, I was one of those annoying people that did a master's because I was like, I want another year of uni. 
<laughs> um, you know, I'm very aware it's a privileged position to be in, but basically it kind of, this kind of came about, this interest kind of came about through doing a, a master's in cultural geography, you know, and doing, reading all this stuff in the humanities and in social sciences about, you know, the human body and how it was all choreographed movement and everything was very controlled and and I just remember sitting there thinking that's a load of rubbish because that's not what my experience is and there was no no one talking about it basically um and I kind of chose to do a little master's dissertation on it and then through doing that I realized oh my god this is a lot deeper than I realized um yeah and then I kind of went went into that um yeah so I think yeah just ge yeah generally like my my I, I guess my kind of identity um is the entire reason that I'm doing a you know a PhD and doing doctoral research into this um I just got fed up of not seeing representation I suppose <laughs> Mm. I'm just going to read that out. Not really a question, but the autistic community has had a disturbingly similar struggle with service <laughs> yes. and had to create their own spaces. I yeah, for sure. I could definitely agree. I, I, I often say to people when talking about it, like, because people often struggle to understand what I'm trying to get at. And I say, you know, look at some of the newer literature regarding autism in, in the autistic community. You know, people have been writing about this and publishing about this critically and, and, and doing a great job of it. But then you look at the Tourette's kind of discourse and it's almost like 15, 20 years behind for some reason. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think that's, yeah, that's a really good point to, to mention. And I think for anyone who might be interested in that sort of stuff, like, you know, have a look at, at um, yeah anything to do with like the autistic community and kind of yeah facilitating online spaces of community as well that's yeah yeah thanks for bringing that up we're just about out of time um but robbie's heavily put um your contact details if anyone wants to contact you jonathan you've raised your hand I just had a quick question and I can't ask a question because I'm like a co-host so it doesn't allow me to do the Q&A thing. Um, and I don't, it might have been at the start, but I don't remember like about how many people in the UK are either diagnosed with Tourette's syndrome or are considered to have? Yeah, so I'm just looking on a document because this statistic was updated this week and I don't want to give the wrong one. <laughs> uh, I think it was like five, is it five percent? Um, oh no, it's gone down apparently. Okay, so thinking about diagnosis, um, it says in the UK they reckon there's like 0.6 percent to one percent with a diagnosis, but I think it was like five percent, they reckon it's five percent because of, you know, lack of access to services that will help people get diagnosed and and kind of stigma so that it, again it's basically white um cis men who are i say men children <laughs> who are getting diagnosed with it you know it's very rarely you know teenage girls which is why there's this hype around all this like confusion or stress around you know teenage girls using it they say oh it's not tourette's it's tourette like symptoms because they use tiktok um but yeah so long story short less than one percent have a diagnosis um up to five percent um likely have it no, no. You know, um, Danny, <laughs> danny's said similar to autism lack of diagnosis does not help a hundred percent agree um and oh yeah that links into exactly what i was going to say there uh so you know it's an absolute nightmare to get a diagnosis as an adult uh, oh no way oh. Sorry, just sorry, I'm getting distracted looking at Danny's messages there. But um, yeah, all participants who, who I've spoken to in, in this research and actually also in my master's research have had an absolute nightmare getting diagnosed as with adulthood onset. Um, and, and, yeah, it 
long story short, it's a nightmare. A lot of gaslighting involved. A lot of, oh no, you must have had tics as a child. Um, or people accusing people of faking it for attention a lot of the time, sadly. The next part of the question says, is there any information on the percentage of those with Tourette's who are LGBT? Um, I don't know. I don't think so. We were mentioning that beforehand, weren't we? Um, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think, I've, I'm not aware of any, but if anyone is, um, or anyone comes across anything. Yeah, yeah I also imagine the, with the, the data that we have on the percentage of people mm. in the UK who are LGBT to begin with is not very yeah. great. Yeah, I will say though that, you know, looking at kind of like the demographics of my participants, which I realised I didn't actually <laughs> chat about, but um, looking at the demographics and the fact that, I mean, I, I've got 19 participants so far and there are three who are trans on the binary. I didn't think that was particularly groundbreaking, but looking at, you know, kind of my colleagues in, in the office and their kind of demographic data, a lot of them don't have anyone who is not cisgender in, in, their, um, their, in their stuff. And, and a lot of them have said that, you know, that a lot of people have said that they're straight as well. I've not written specific information about, you know, um, kind of sexuality in the demographic information there. I just haven't asked it. But from kind of building, you know, relationships with your participants when you do participatory research, you know, there, there's a significant amount of the participants involved are queer or do identify as queer. Um, whereas, yeah, I don't know. So I don't know if there's anything official, but I, I have definitely noticed that I do have, I do seem to often kind of encounter more queer and trans people in my research than a lot of my PhD colleagues do. Really interesting and that could be for all sorts of reasons and that could be like because yourself yeah identify that way and you're approachable or the methods that you're using. Yeah yeah it's hard to tell. And there's a question from Danny that says did any of your participants have differential diagnosis? Has this affected their experience? Assuming this is in relation to kind of like comorbid or like other diagnoses of other um, kind of disabilities or like neurodiversities and, and, and the one I didn't ask specifically, um, but a lot of people did bring up um, ADHD, autism and OCD were the ones that came up the most and, and lots of people have kind of talked about, you know, how their experiences are influenced by all of them in different ways, you know, so um, actually, a conversation I had the other the um, that I haven't put in this yet, and I'm still even a bit. But from a conversation I had the other week um, with a participant, she was kind of chatting about how she is trans and how she feels like Tourette's draws people's attention, and then after that they forget she has Tourette's because they notice that she's trans because she uh, it doesn't it, it struggles to kind of pass as um female or as femme i suppose um so yeah i think that's just one example um i think you know there's so many layers to it and i guess it's kind of almost like cyclical the way that they all kind of interact and, and influence each other and um yeah but long story short lots of participants have kind of disclosed to me that they they have other diagnoses but um it's likely that there are more than I'm aware of because I, I didn't specifically ask for it, if that makes sense. I was, I was wondering about your methods and yes. the use of zines. Um, why specifically zines? Yeah, um, so I am personally a very visual person. And if I'm completely transparent, to start with, I wanted to do zines because I like creative visual things and I, I enjoy it. Like there wasn't an awful lot of thought behind it. And then as I started to kind of, you know, do reading and proper planning in my first year of PhD, I realized, okay, it, it was more than just, I like cutting and sticking and making pretty pictures, you know? Um, and I think lots of, even like chatting to participants and stuff, I feel like, because like I said, so it was participatory. So I kind of came with like an idea and I said, let's you know talk about it 
we can get rid of anything, we can add anything on, whatever. And lots of people were really excited about the idea of using zines, partly because it's kind of, um, you know, it's got a long history of kind of being used to, to combat potentially problematic narratives or to kind of, you know, um, I guess subvert, yeah, subvert these kind of mainstream narratives and things. And, and that people were also kind of frustrated in my previous master's research, people were saying that they were frustrated that when there was like radio appearances and things or people who had Tourette's that the ticks were um, like censored and things. And there were, there's a lot of frustration over censoring and filtering of, of kind of experiences of Tourette's syndrome. <laughs> um, and I think, I don't know, the, the messy, chaotic nature of um, zines and the fact it is unfiltered, like there are spelling mistakes all over the zines and, you know, that's part of what makes it so great, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, there are people who write Tourette syndrome, like um, T-O-U-R-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. Some people have written Tourette's syndrome. Um, you know, pe some people have written it in its full um, they've written like De La Tourette Syndrome, you know, people like even call the Tourette Syndrome different things. And you might have noticed that in some of the zine content that I showed here. Um, so yeah, I think zines are just so, I don't know, I just feel like they're so tactile and it gives people an opportunity to kind of <laughs> not only just do stuff that is unfiltered, but also it's kind of like playful and, and some somewhat childish it feels like, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, and I think it's kind of like childlike nature and being so playful as, as a as a practice kind of, I don't want to say like breaks down barriers, but, you know, people feel like they can kind of let go a bit. They don't feel like they have to, from my own experience anyway, in the discussions had in the zine workshops, people at first were very like all trying to share very well thought out, like finished points and ideas. But by the end of the workshop, people were just feeling a bit more free to, you know, share less you know well formulated arguments that they think are worthy or appropriate for a PhD thesis you know people are just kind of chatting and yeah I don't know like for example like swearing and cussing more you know that people were more relaxed and I think that was that's more representative um, of people's experience rather than them trying to filter it for my needs if that makes sense that's a very roundabout way of saying it but yeah, I babble on, so I'll stop. No, that's really interesting because I was interested in your, your research question about the reflecting on your use of collaborative methods. Um, Danny, sorry, you added to your question and I'd already asked a question, but uh, Danny's question says, thank you for your answer. If I can be cheeky and extend it beyond comorbidities, I uh, wondered if there were also different ones like diagnosed with con conversion disorder, FND, before being yes. diagnosed with Tourette's. Yeah, so there's a few, as far as I'm aware, the vast majority of my participants, I can only think of two off the top of my head, um, were diagnosed with Tourette syndrome first. Um, the other two, it, they were diagnosed with ADHD and some have said, and they've said like, they just diagnosed me with Tourette syndrome because I was there and they said, oh, you've probably got this too. Um, I, I won't comment on what I think about that, but <laughs> um, yeah, so like a lot, there's a few participants who are particularly kind of in the process of looking for a diagnosis with, of, of FND, you know, it's kind of dependent on, on what, I, it's, it's a weird one though, because like, sorry, I'm, I'm babbling on and going on a tangent, but you know, thinking about FND in particular, like it's, there's a lot of new kind of literature and new, I don't want to say craze, but I'll use that word because I don't know what else to use, like a craze around um, diagnosing people with FND. And it's kind of like Tourette-like symptoms that, you know, could be FND, such as leg dropping ticks. So when I ask some of my participants about Tourette's specifically, some of them have described for them how like a leg drop tick is significant in terms of like being a part of their experience of Tourette's, but you know, that is now kind of being written and, and assumed that it's not Tourette's, it's FND. Yeah, the participants still kind of, you know, you understand their experience 
as that being a part of Tourette's, if that makes sense. But I don't know. I, I don't even know if that's answered your question, but um, a mixture of yes and no, I suppose, and sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's more conversations to be had and a lot of follow-ups to do. So definitely more to think about for sure. Oh, um, an FND, sorry, is functional neurological disorder. Sorry, I should have specified that. Yeah, um, so that's just written from my own experience. Doctors cared more about ADHD versus autism <laughs> as the form that they could prescribe for. Mm, yeah, that's yeah, really interesting. <laughs> I think some of my participants have sorry, I don't like that phrasing, some participants that have been involved have kind of, yeah, said about that. And, you know, I kind of briefly mentioned it in terms of bringing up, you know, um, prescription of specific medications and stuff. Um, I think there's not one set thing to prescribe for Tourette's. Um, and I don't know whether perhaps that's fed into to kind of FND because there is more that is tended to be prescribed for FND at the moment um but I don't know interesting is there, is there any way you would recommend if people wanted to learn more about experiences with Tourette's yeah. um, any particular books or websites or anything like that yeah um so i can send it in the chat but the charity i work with is pretty pretty good in terms of their social media their website's not very accessible to be honest but you know their social media has a lot of interesting uh, information um <laughs> and usually i would say in the past i would not have recommended this but yeah so there's Tourette's action which is a uk charity that has recently kind of had a change in leadership in in, in the board and their focus has been very much recently in the last few weeks even has been more about sharing people's like kind of snippets of people's experiences um so yeah Tourette's action and then tick hull in yorkshire um was two charities and ironically i kind of encourage people to not look at the nhs website because it's pretty inaccurate but yeah understandable <laughs> mm. um jonathan did mention at the beginning we run these quite frequently and they're on youtube um so you can watch them back but thank you so much dan for coming along i know that he's got to rush off um and yeah just all our thanks from from the staff red network and the disabled staff network as well no thanks for having me and thanks for people for asking questions really really interesting lots to think about it's really good thank you so much